Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the session. There will be few sessions like these where we are discussing the MCQs on the anatomy subject on various subtopics. Today we have taken up the topic of the head and neck. So today we will be dealing with this, these uh, MCQs. I am Dr. Anket, anatomy educator in our Anacademy platform. Let us see some important slides. Your need PG vitals which have come, which have all the recorded videos, so you can have a look at them as well. This is the last leap marathon which has started from 22nd of Jan. It's for one month, so that is also very important, the marathon series. Then we also have this, uh, for the FMG students, we have the Crack FMG 23, which is FMG Mastery. That's going to start on 6th of Feb, that is on Monday. And duration will be around 4 months. And all the various educators will be taking up these sessions. We also have this Republic Day, today being Republic Day. And uh, we have this uh, discount going on, that is valid uh, for a couple of days more than the Republic Day, 28th of Jan. These are all the various offers. You can use the code DR Dr. Ankit uh, 10, 10 if you want to avail these offers. This is the code which you can use to avail these offers. Let us come for back to our topic. The topic was the head and neck MCQs. Let us see a few MCQs over here. The first MCQ goes like that after asking a 47 year old lady to open her mouth wide and say ah like this, the position notes deviation of the uvula to the left side and asymmetry in the elevation of the soft pellet with the right side of the pellet sagging as noted in the figure. So right side of pellet is sagging down and the uvula is deviated towards the left side. What a specific nerve is most likely damaged? So in this question we can see there is nothing has been talked about the sensory parts of the uvula or the soft pellet. Here we are dealing with the muscular part of the muscles of soft pellet. We should be knowing that the muscles of soft pellet are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus. Now pharyngeal plexus pharyngeal plexus has a ninth nerve, it has the tenth nerve and it also will have the sympathetic nerves. So here the muscle or the motor nerves which are supplying the muscles of the soft pellet are coming up from the tenth that is a vagus nerve, right. So now we have to choose the vagus nerve in these options. So B and C are the option, but now which one to choose? See the uvula is deviating towards the left side. It tells us that the left side of the soft pellet, the muscles are contracting. Well, the basic nature of the muscle is contractility. While the right side of the pellet muscles are not contracting, the other thing that is given in the exam is the, in the question is that the pellet is sagging down. So right side soft pellet muscles are not working. So it means that the right side the vagus nerve should not be working, and therefore the answer should be option number C over here. That should be the answer. Right. So we should better be knowing the nerve supply of the various parts. If you look at the other options, for example, the left glossopharyngeal nerve, it's a ninth cranial nerve. It is mainly sensory. The only motor or the only muscle which it supplies is the stylopharyngeus. That is a very small muscle in the pharynx. There is nothing to do with the motor or the muscles of the soft pellet, so we can rule it out. Looking at the fourth option, the left hypoglossal nerve, it's a twelfth nerve. And I hope you all know that which group of muscles does it supply? Yeah, it is a motor nerve. It supplies basically the muscles of the tongue all the extrinsic intrinsic muscles of the tongue except the palatoglossus. So ruling out the options, we come to the answer that is option number C. Right? Let's see the end of the question. The second question over here. The question says a 46 year old man is diagnosed with an extra dural tumor in the posterior cranial fossa. Tumor over here. When the patient protruded his tongue during physical examination, the tongue deviates to the right side. Very important, the tongue deviating to the right side and tumor in the posterior cranial fossa. Which of the following muscles and nerves are the most likely injured? You ask the patient to protrude the tongue, the tongue is going to the right side. If you ask the patient to protrude the tongue and the tongue is going to the right side, that is the whole soul. Which muscle, which nerve? Now, there is a thing which we should know regarding tongue. That tongue deviates to the paralyzed side on protrusion. Or you can remember the mnemonic that the tongue licks the wound. Remember the mnemonic if you can, that the tongue licks the wound. The tongue licks the wound, meaning wherever the wound is, the tongue will deviate to that side. So wherever the paralyzed uh, side is, the tongue will deviate to that side. So it means that applying that mnemonic, the tongue is deviating to the right side. So the right side should be the pathology. We go at the options right hypoglossal nerve, right hyaluronic Option number A looks perfect over here. But the hypoglossal nerve is a nerve which supplies the muscles of the tongue. 
and the main muscle of the tongue is the genioglossus and not surprisingly it being the bulk of the tongue the main action of genioglossus it helps in protrusion right so when the right hypoglossal nerve is not working and the right genioglossus is not working the left genioglossus is functioning fine and that pushes the tongue to right side therefore tongue is diverting to the paralyzed side or tongue lifts the wound you can remember the mnemonic other option you can easily rule out left side no issues hyoglossus is the muscle of tongue right but what action of hyoglossus is the hyoid bone is below muscle is going from hyo hyoid bone to the tongue it will depress the tongue geniohyoid now geniohyoid is not the muscle of the tongue it is going from genial tubercle of the mandible to the hyoid right it might help in opening of mouth might help in swallowing but it is not a muscle of the tongue clear answer over here is option number a let's see another question slightly longer 45 year old man was seen in the emergency after being knocked down in a street brawl he had received a blow on the head with an empty bottle on examination the patient was conscious and had a large swelling over the back of the head that was restricted to the area of the occiput one of the most important point over here that the swelling was restricted to the area of a particular bone over here the occipital bone the skin was intact and the swelling fluctuated on palpation the following statement concerning this patient are correct except what's wrong over here so he was involved in a in a in a fight or whatever he was stuck on the back of the head by by empty bottle and swelling started over here but that was restricted to the particular bone the bone we know behind is occipital bone and they are asking which statement is wrong hematoma did not extend it forward to the orbital margins and did not extend laterally as far as the temporal lines hematoma was located just beneath the epineurosis hematoma is uh, restricted to one skull bone and is situated beneath the periosteum edge of the swelling is limited by the attachment of the periosteum to the sutural ligaments what's wrong over here once you look at the options carefully you will realize that option b and c are contradicting each other one of them should be right so even if we know nothing about this whole question and all even then you can understand that b and c cannot be correct because one is saying it is just beneath the epineurosis and one is saying that it is beneath the periosteum it can be one only so automatically with your common sense or smart sense you can rule out a and d you can see the the answer should be between b and c which is wrong over here the answer over here is actually is option number b answer is option number b let us see how it is not just beneath it is not just beneath the epineurosis but in fact it is beneath the periosteum the reason over here is you have to understand that suppose this is a skull bone and a suture over here and a suture and a skull bone let us say this is occipital bone right and there is a periosteum which is covering the bone right this periosteum is fused to the sutural ligaments over here that is imagine p for periosteum and that is oc dot occipital bone now epineurosis is higher up a p for epineurosis now if the hematoma or if the bleeding is occurring just beneath the epineurosis you have the loose areolar tissue over here would it be confined to a bone no it would spread out everywhere may give rise to uh, black eye or the raccoon eyes but when the bleeding is just beneath the periosteum at this point then obviously as the periosteum is fused to the ligaments it would be solely confined to a particular bone that was the case over here so option c is perfectly all right the hematoma is situated beneath the periosteum but not beneath the if just not just beneath the epineurosis we can say hematoma is beneath the epineurosis but just beneath the epineurosis is not a correct statement answer will be, will be option number b right let's see another question a 3 month old male infant has a lump in his neck a biopsy of the lump shows it to be thymic tissue based on the embryonic origin which of the following additional structures is most likely to have an ectopic location so a young young what say 3 month infant you saw a lump in the neck and that came out to be the thymus the tissue thymus we all know the thymus is pulled down into the superior mediastinum and may go to the anterior mediastinum as well that is in the thoracic region but it was in the neck so they are asking you that is there any other structure that is related to the thymus so when the thymus has the ectopic location what else you can link thymus with is there any other structure that is developing with the thymus so that if there is a ectopic location of thymus then you are not only confined to thymus but you think of something else also this is where the knowledge comes into the clinical or the practical way if you don't know these you will only be confined to thymus only so now coming back to the question thymus is derived from the third endodermal pouch so the topic over here is actually the pharyngeal arches 
thymus comes from the third uh, third endodermal pouch and third endodermal pouch gives rise to thymus as well as one more structure that we should know and you can remember the mnemonic over here when we write third third is basically th for thymus i is for i is for the inferior parathyroid gland so i is the inferior parathyroid gland also known as parathyroid 3 parathyroid 3 coming from the third pouch so if there is a ectopic location of thymus we can argue that we should check the inferior parathyroid gland as well and therefore answer becomes our option number c over here being the answer <laughs> right lymph nodes develop sep uh, separately lingual tonsil for the tongue part thyroid gland has a total aeroglossal duct so over here the thymus and inferior parathyroid gland remember the superior parathyroid gland comes from the uh, the pouch but it is known as parathyroid 4 this comes from the fourth pouch right so this is your about the pharyngeal arches so topics very important about the pharyngeal arches and their various development let us see one more last question over here <coughs> interesting question the 48 year old male complains of diplopia diplopia we all know double vision on neurological examination he is unable to adduct his left eye he is unable to adduct the left eye you should know adduction of an eye is by which main muscle that should be clear and and lacks a corneal <coughs> reflex on the left side <coughs> excuse me so there are two things that he is unable to adduct the left eye and lacks a corneal reflex on the left side so both things are on the left side where is the most likely location of the lesion resulting in the symptom <coughs> so unable to adduct the left eye the muscle involved over here is medial rectus we all know the nerve supply of this that is the third cranial nerve while corneal reflex when we discuss corneal reflex there are in any reflex there is afferent and efferent there is an afferent and there is an efferent both the they are two limbs of the reflex always so when you touch the cornea or the conjunctiva with the wisp of cotton that is afferent so afferent is carried by the trigeminal nerve which part of the division of trigeminal nerve v1 right and the result of this corneal reflex is that you tightly close your eyelids. The muscle over here is the, your orbicularis oculi that is supplied by the seventh, the facial nerve. So now they are asking you that where is the location of the lesion? So some out of these four something should be carrying at least all of three or at least two of them. One from here, one from here. They, then only we can justify now that there is unable to adduction. So third nerve is involved. So third nerve ophthalmic and facial nerve should have a, some common thing inferior orbital fissure basically carries the maxillary nerve and uh, you have the infraorbital nerve that is maxillary part and some of the inferior uh, vessels maxillary vessels to the max optic canal carries the optic nerve and ophthalmic artery not involved superior orbital fissure is the answer over here why because it carries the third nerve as well as the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal though it doesn't carry the facial but at least these two so yeah foramen oval will be having the structures we all know about the, <coughs> the mnemonic male male over here is the mandibular nerve and the lesser petrosal nerve these are two nerves none of them is involved over here therefore the answer for this question will be the superior orbital fissure the topic basically is the skull foramen right that is the topic basically so that we have to be through with so guys, this is a few of the MCQs. Thank you for listening and uh, I hope you enjoyed and keep on revising. We have a few days left. I will be there with you throughout the whole journey of your exams. And uh, next topic will come with the neuroanatomy, some of the important MCQs for there. Thank you and all the best.